Well, thank you so much for being here. I know this is the last session of the day, and so I'm very impressed that you are here. It goes to say that you are the only one who are truly responsible for what you do. <laughs> okay, so uh, today's topic is about responsible AI. As you know, ever since the announcement of ChatGPT in November 2022, and our industry, the tech industry, has been going through this explosive growth and excitement about generative AI. And, um, you know, every day we see new models coming out with better performance, bigger, larger models. And at the same time, there's also equally amount of fears happening. People are afraid of, you know, gen, um, uh, gen, uh, the super intelligence or general intelligence happening that's gonna take over humanity. So some of the fears are reasonable, some are not. So this is why it's important for us to think about, you know, being responsible when we build AI systems, especially now because AI was um, started in 1956, I think it's, None of you guys were born, born then, right? <laughs> and um, so AI went through several, you know, waves. And um, every time when there's a wave, we, we make some progression in AI. But with generative AI, this time is a little bit different because this is the first time that AI is not just doing analysis for us. AI is generating new content. Sometimes even the data scientists cannot explain the outcome of the AI system. So that goes to say, you know, we, we need to be very careful. Some people call it, we are going through this AI Oppenheimer time. Have you seen that movie, Oppenheimer? This uh, atomic bomb. And, <laughs> you know, what we are inventing right now is very powerful. But if we are not careful, it can cause a lot of harm. So not trying to scare you, but we do need to think about being responsible when we build technology. So before I get into it, I just want to introduce the organization I'm representing, Generative AI Commons, and we are part of Linux Foundation, LFAI, and Data. We're created to help advance the generative AI technology and innovation via open source and open science. And we have over uh, 200 active members coming from 80 plus organizations. It is a place for thought leadership building, as well as a platform for um, open source project innovation. And um, we subscribe to open membership. In other words, you don't have to belong to any co member companies of LFAI and data. Anybody in the world can come participate and contribute. And it is volunteer based. We have four work streams right now and each work stream has got work stream leaders. These are all volunteers. And so these are the four work streams. Um, the first one is called MAT, Model Application Data. It doesn't mean these people are mad. They're just passionate about generative AI comments. So we work on projects in the, this, in the generative AI space. And currently this group is developing a gen AI landscape. And then after that, we'll develop um, architectures, reference architectures, um, ecosystem, et cetera. And the next one is called Frameworks um, Workstream. And you've heard yesterday, Jim Zemlin talked about model openness framework. So that is the, our number one deliverable of this group. And it's a very important work because there's a lot of open washing going on in order to sh give the model producers the opportunity to show their tr uh, openness of their models, then um, this work can be a very effective. And it is a very complex work, it's very hard to do. And um, if you have not heard anything about MOF, I have a talk about MOF tomorrow uh, with OSI um, Mer, um, Joyce, and we're gonna talk about you know um, both uh, organizations, how we achieve openness. Um, we have a different ways of showing openness for AI models. So the talk tomorrow is about two o'clock. And on the third work stream is education and outreach work stream. And this work stream, we develop a ton of white papers, blogs. We have regular webinars. The first webinar was about the importance of openness in Gen AI. The second webinar is gonna happen September tw uh, 22nd. It's about the role of data in Gen AI. So again, you know, um, our responsibility is not just to innovate, but also educate the masses. We've developed education materials. 
And if you are brand new to Gen AI, feel free to participate in our meetings and you don't have to say anything. You can just sit there and learn and hopefully eventually you can contribute. And the last work stream is called Responsible AI. And today's presentation material is gonna be based on the work being done by this work stream. And we're currently developing Responsible AI framework called RAF. And it is in a draft form. So I'm giving you a sneak preview of, of this work. And so bear in mind, it's not complete, but it will give you a pretty good overview of what Responsible AI is. And uh, please go to our website, genaicommons.org. You'll find a lot more information, including meeting times and doubting information. So first we need to um, define what, um, what is responsible AI. A lot of companies have definition of responsible AI, but they all have this commercial interest. So it's important for a community like this to define responsible AI. Why we need to have this definition? It's because we need to have this shared understanding of creating um, uh, the foundation for collaboration. So we need to have a shared understanding. We agree on that understanding so we can collaborate better. We can speak the same language, so to speak, and we can create measurable standards and match bar benchmark to measure how effective we are in building responsible AI. And also um, it's a way to build trust between model users, model producers, and the society at large. And last but not least, this work can benefit Benefit um, policymakers to make, you know, um, regulatory requirements or policies for responsible AI. And with that definition, we can help align all these various parties to um, build responsible AI um, projects, um, including regulatory. Like in Europe, there's a you know EU AI Act. In US, you know the White House has um, you know the US government also has some AI related policies. And in China, China is at the forefront of um, AI policy making. In Hong Kong, I just Googled it yes, uh, yesterday, Hong Kong's H, um, HKMA Monetary Authority came up with this AI um, guidelines for banking industry. And um, standards, NIST, and the ISO SC42, they're also doing some work there. Academic various universities are working on responsible AI, and Stanford actually has a ton of work in this area too. And community, like Generative AI Commons, and other communities are also working on that. So if we have a common definition, then you know all these different bodies can work together and collaborate and align. So, um, here is a definition. Uh, we believe that responsible AI consists of these eight um, dimensions. Human-centered and aligned, accessible, reliable, transparent and explainable, accountability, privacy and security, compliant and controllable, ethical and inclusive and sustainable. So uh, for the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna go through each one of them. I'm gonna talk about what we mean by um, you know, each one of them. And also I'll talk about the challenges and what we can do as an open source community to meet those challenges. The number one dimension is called human-centered aligned. So AI systems should be rooted in human values and societal needs, recognizing that most algorithms are derived from human systems like brain theory and social science sciences. And so it is, um, so who can give me a definition of human values? It's really hard, right? Because human values are very diverse because we come from diverse backgrounds. We, have, we come from different religious backgrounds. People have different political beliefs, different regions, different sexual orientations. And so all these values need to be included in order to make an AI system that's truly diverse and truly serving the you know, all people. 
So in order to meet that challenge, so when we build AI system, we should include diverse stakeholders. So it's not just engineers or developers or data scientists. We should also include sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists, policy makers, and people who have interest in this area. And the more diverse stakeholders we involve, our AI systems will be more aligned with human values and societal needs. And we need to balance AI autonomy with human control. So obviously we created AI systems to help us automate things, but if AI is going rogue on us, then it could be a problem. So we, so we always need to make sure that the human can take over in case um, AI goes to la la land, right? So we do that by implementing robust feedback mechanisms for continuous alignment with human values. And a lot of um, model producers include an alignment team. So you'll see, you know, title like director of alignment. When they say that, that means, you know, make, they want to make sure that their AI system is truly aligned with human values and avoid biases. So this is a big problem for a lot of AI systems. And um, I can give you an example. Um, uh, Blue, uh, uh, Bloomberg did this um, research on um, professional profiles using, um, using stability AI. So Bloomberg asked the stability AI to give a thousand images of you know, business executives. And guess what? 93% of the images came back showing it's a white male or light color male images. And then Bloomberg asked the stability AI to um, give uh, a thousand images of um, service level workers. Guess what? 94% of image came out to be dark color females. So that goes to say AI systems can perpetual biases because we have a lot of information on the internet that's biased and a lot of AI systems, they crawl the public internet and, and AI is trained on bias. Just like when you teach your kids, if you teach your kids prejudice, your kids is gonna become prejudicial, uh, prejudiced people too. So um, in order to meet that challenge, we need to develop guidelines and standards for human-centered AI designs. The next dimension is accessible and reliable. AI system needs to be accessible to all segments of society, providing reliable and consistent performance across different contexts and populations. Um, a few weeks ago, I attended OSPOS for Good at, organized by UN in New York, and they talked about digital divide. And obviously we have the Western world and you know, which have more resources, more talents in technology. And, and then we, they call the global south, the developing countries. They don't have the kind of resources and expertise. So we see a digital divide with AI showing up and this digital divide is gonna get deeper if we don't address that issue. And so the solution for that is to build awareness you know, we need to be aware when we build AI systems, we can't just stay in our bubbles. We need to think about, you know, reaching out to the global world and which includes language support. And language, I'm not just talking about national language, I'm also talking about dialects. Like for example, you know, a lot of dialects, you know, even in China, there's a lot of dialects or different provinces got different dialect. Each dialect brings in the culture. So whenever a language or dialect is missing from our you know, repository, from our database, that part of a culture is missing too. So in order to preserve that culture, we also need to make sure we include as many languages as possible. I met this uh, researcher from Canada um, at the UN conference, and she um, incorporated like 2,000 African languages into her AI system. And this is a very important work because she's not just thinking about building a very comprehensive AI system. She's also preserving the cultures from those languages. And we need to invest in infrastructures to improve digital access. So there's this nonprofit called Digital Public Good Alliance, and that's their mission is to help, you know, um, to, re to obtain the, the digital goods and serve those um, underserved countries. 
And we need to ensure system perform reliably in diverse real world conditions and overcoming the technical limitations. And not just because they have access, we also need to make sure they are reliable. I remember I went to Botswana one time to talk about cloud computing in the middle of the meeting, the power went out. <laughs> So even you have the technology, if it's not reliable, then it's not going to work. So we want to make sure we develop robust models that generates well across different settings and continuously monitor and improve systems to secure reliability. And the third dimension is transparent and explainable. And AI systems should be transparent in their operations and decisions and provide explanations that are understandable to users and stakeholders. So this is a tough one because AI systems, especially those fun, um, foundational AI systems are large, huge. They have over hundreds of billions of parameters and a lot of times that they are just, it's not intelligible. In other words, even the data scientists couldn't explain why certain outcomes happen certain way. It's because the system is so complex, but it doesn't mean we should not try. We should still try and make sure that, you know, there's transparency. If there's no transparency, then to me, then the AI system is not trustworthy. So, but then there's all obviously trade-off between complexity and explainability, right? And then also sometimes you need to incorporate proprietary data or information into the AI system and then proprietary data like PII, personal information or healthcare information, it cannot be, you know, open to the public. So there's a lot of, um, you know, conundrums there. And potential solution, we do believe that open source is a key way to go. So we want to encourage the, the model producer community, AI system building community to be as open as possible. And some model producers can use openness as their differentiator comparing to proprietary black box systems. And we, we can also develop inter, um, interpretable models and techniques to extract um, explanation from complex models. And we can develop tools like visualization tools to help us see what's under the hook of an AI system. And, you know, um, policymakers can also, you know, create regulatory frameworks and, and then require transparency in the system. So here I'm going to show you some examples of some of the organizations, their attempt to show transparency and openness. Like I said, Stanford um, has a lot of, um, you know, is doing a lot of great work. They, are, they have this uh, department called Center for Research and Foundation Models. And so this um, one project they, were, they did was the, it's called Foundational Model Transparency Index. What they did is they picked some of, you know, like over 10 top models and they scored them against over 100 transparency indicators just to show how transparent they are. So they get the information from model producers themselves and then they go through this, you know, uh, scoring process. As you can see, no one is 100% transparent. So we still have a long way to go, but it is a good attempt to show that, you know, because when you are using AI system, you want to use something that's more transparent. And um, generative AI comments, like I said earlier, um, we created MOF, uh, Model Openness Framework, to prevent um, open, to, you know, address open washing because a lot of model producers say, you know, their models are open, but then they play games in the license and we call it open washing, right? And in order to address that, we came up with this um, framework and you, some of you might be familiar with this, some are not. Uh, so basically we take um, the 16 components of an AI model uh, life cycle and we look for the availability of such a component and also the license they're using for the component. And when we say open, open is not the same as, openness is not the same as transparency. Transparency means the information is available, but openness, when we talk about openness, we're saying, you know, the license they use has to adhere to OSI approved licenses. So we looked at this 16 components. If it's a code, we want the code to be uh, using the open source uh, OSI approved licenses, such as Apache, MIT, BSD, et cetera, or Mulan. And 
for um, structured content, we want them to use CDLA, which is a data license by Linux Foundation. And, and structured content, like such as documents, we want them to use Creator um, Commons CCBY 4.0. And so it's the best attempt. And obviously, we, we're still in the middle of you know, we wrote this out for a few months already. We're getting feedback from model producers. And the common feedback is, it is a very important work. I'm glad you guys are doing it, but you know, it's very complex. You have a lot more work to do. So, so it is a good start, but you know, we welcome your feedback and let's make it, um, let's make it more, um, you know, reasonable, practical for model producers as well as model users. So we take the 16 components and then we categorize them into three classes. The base class is mo uh, open model. The class two is open tooling. The class, you know, uh, and then the first class is called open science. And when a model that means open science standard, that means everything's open, right? Like um, LLM 360 is open, 100% open. And then, but most of the models today are class three models because class two, like um, a lot of training code, inference code, some companies want to keep them as proprietary as a differentiator, which is totally understandable. So what we are providing is a spectrum of openness, but at least they can be completely open about how open they are. So instead of just saying I'm open, which is very vague, we want them, we want the model producers to be very clear about how open they are. And uh, OSI is the, you know, they're the steward of the definition of open source for the last 26 years. And um, they are highly respectable in, by the open source community. Currently they are working on open source AI definition. And that's another way of addressing openness for AI models. Okay, let's move on to next dimension, which is accountability. We want to make sure that AI, there should be a clear mechanisms for assigning responsibility and accountability for the actions and decisions of AI systems. And this is related to the previous dimension. It's very hard to be transparent, completely transparent of an AI system. So in other words, tracing the decision-making process of AI system can be very challenging. And this is where we can, we need better comprehensive documentations and audit trails. And also legal and ethical framework is really hard to do. Like a lot of policy makers, they realize that for the internet era, they kind of missed the boat, right? Because they re after internet became so prevalent, they realized, oh, we, we, need to gov we need to somehow regulate that. It could be a problem. And then social media showed up, Facebook, Instagram, they missed the boat again. You know, the harm is done. A lot of teenage kids, they were saying, I went to a, I went to a lecture, uh, there's a Spence, uh, Stanford uh, psychologist who was saying the teenage suicide rate has increased like 30% because of the social media. So now for the AI era, the policymakers want to stay ahead of the game. So that's why we're seeing all kinds of, you know, AI related policies and regulations are coming out. But because technology is moving so fast, they're still playing, the policymakers are still playing catch up. So it is very hard to do. And once they have a policies, it, it's hard to enforce. They have to think about how to enforce like organizations and individuals and keep them accountable. So these are the challenges, but Personally, I feel what's more important is to foster a culture of responsibility. You know, instead of using a stick, I think carrots better, right? As technologists, we all want to do good to the world, to the humanity. So we need to foster this culture of responsibility and ethics and, and then to do the right thing. Okay, the next dimension is privacy and security. And this is not new. This has been, this, you know, area of concerns has been around ever since we have computer systems, right? There's always security issues and then we have solutions to meet the security issues. And then um, now with the cloud computing, now we're talking about privacy, right? Because you have data everywhere. So we need to also make sure we protect the, the privacy of individuals and then security also becomes even more vulnerable because you got the cloud and everything is sitting out there in the cloud. And with AI, we're taking this issue to the next level. And so similar situation, you know, as the, uh, the current 
um, the current um, cloud computing. There's a risk of data breaches and unauthorized access. And then we need to have a good balance for uh, data access with privacy concerns. And we can address that by using encryption or access control or privacy by design. And then for a lot of model producers, they have this red team and blue team. To red team will come up with certain attack scenarios, the blue team will try to address those scenarios. And um, also ensuring compliance with data protection regulation could be very challenging. Again, you know, do internal audit and uh, regularly update and to address potential vulnerabilities. And there's an open SSF project under Linux Foundation. They have a working group specifically for AI and machine learning. And um, I would encourage you to check it out. And the next dimension is compliant and control controllable. And um, all systems should comply with the relevant laws, regulations, and standards, and should remain under human control. So the challenge is keeping up with rapidly evolving regulatory landscape. Like I said, you know, the policymakers are trying to make regulations, but things are moving so fast. Even their regulations have to have an amendment and also enforcement like AI, um, European AI, um, AI Act. It's in, uh, right now, it's, um, it's been published, but it's not gonna be in effect in 20, until 2026. You know, it's really, it takes a full-time job to keep track of those things. And that goes to say you should probably work Work closely with your, you know, um, in-house attorneys to make sure that they're informed, and then they can keep your team informed and engaged. And then um, ensuring the systems can be uh, controlled and overridden by humans, like you know, pilots, right? They can use autopilot to fly planes, but whenever necessary, they can take over while manually control the plane. Autonomous is driving; it's the same thing. You can let your car drive itself, but then whenever necessary, you can take over the control. Same as AI systems, we should be thinking about, you know, building in um, human control into the system when necessary. And we need to address the risk of autonomous systems because when something is autonomous, there's always a risk, right? So you, we should always be conscientious about addressing the potential issues and then you know keep doing the regular audits and risk assessment. Ethical and inclusive. So AI systems needs to be ethical, uh, operated ethically, and be inclu uh, and be inclusive, considering, considering the needs and rights of all individuals and groups. We need to mitigate biases. Earlier, I talked about biases, and we need to ensure the benefits are distributed uh, across fairly across all society. And we need to balance ethical consideration with practical implementation. And bias audit, fairness evaluation, diverse communities uh, involved in AI development and deployment, and ethical guidelines and oversight committees. All these are ways to ensure that we are building AI system that's ethical and inclusive. And um, oh, and then uh, the next dimension, last but not least, is called sustainable, and we. The AI system development and deployment should be sustainable and minimize negative impacts on the environment. As you know, most of those large models requires a ton of compute and energy consumptions and, and water, don't forget water, and they also need a ton of water for cooling. So there's this high energy consumptions for training and development, and it can cause dramatic environmental impact. And so we need to be thinking about that. And so the solution is we need to think about develop more energy efficient algorithms, hardware, renewable energies, and um, also may, there might be some software so we can produce to help reduce the carbon footprint of AI technologies. And there's a Green Software Foundation under Linux Foundation does exactly that. They create a trusted ecosystem, people, standards, tooling, and best practice for building green software. Okay, join us. So like I said, this work, uh, this presentation is based on the, the work we are developing um, within the, um, the Responsible AI Frameworks team. We meet every other Thursday, 7 a.m. PST, which is your 10 p.m. Sorry about that, because we want to accommodate to three time zones, including European time zones. So like where I am, we, I get up really early. My day starts at six o'clock. 
And um, yeah, uh, like I said, if Gen AI is completely brand new to you, just dial in and listen and learn. And then hopefully one day you can become a contributor. And I just want to conclude by saying, responsible AI is not just a set of guidelines, it's actually a commitment. You know, as a technologist, we should have that, we should make the commitment to ensure that we build AI systems that is aligned with humanity. It serves the humanity in a positive way. It is fair, inclusive, and beneficial to all. And it is a collective responsibility. So it's not just developers, researchers, policymakers. It's also, you know, anthropologists, other disciplines. They should be all involved in this conversation. That is it. And um, here, I just, you know, we, we recently came out with this survey. If you have time, please fill it out. You are helping us, also helping you out. So we're doing a survey on how companies use generative AI, what kind of issues, challenges they face, and the role of open source. So, um, you know, the more feedback data points we have, the more accurate our report would be. So that's that. Um, I think I have a few minutes for Q&A if anybody has any question. So are you gonna all be very responsible for when you build AI system? <laughs> and, and like I said, this work is not complete. It's, I'm just giving you an overview. We still need a lot of help. So if you guys are interested in contributing, please join our work, work stream. Yes. Oh, he, yeah, gentlemen there, he raised his hand first. We would love to. Actually, I went to, like I said, I went to OSPOS for good, um, you know, organized by United Nations. And I like to reach out to them and then, you know, collaborate with them. And then I have invited the Stanford Transparency Index folks to our community and give us talk about what they do. And I'm showing their work there. Yeah, we, we should collaborate more. I mean, um, you know, it's the thing, the good thing is a lot of members you know, participants in this work stream um, come from co member companies who are already doing a lot of responsible AI stuff. So, you know, the more we can work together with our other organizations, the better. And, and um, oh yeah, by the way, this white paper we're working on responsible AI framework, we're working with a professor from University of Washington. So he's leading that work. So um, a lot of academ uh, academic, you know, professionals like professors, researchers, they are very interested in this work. Um, so it is a good point and you know bring whoever you see um, that is going to help and hopefully we can make this paper a de facto standard you know this is how open source works right it's bottom up if your output is interesting is useful is reasonable people start using it it becomes a de facto standard okay um this um yeah lady mm -hmm. The survey? Yeah, the survey. Oh, the su yeah, the survey is actually separate. I mean, I, I want to promote the survey as much as possible. It's, it's not about responsible AI. It's just in general, we want to understand how enterprises use generative AI, what kind of challenges they meet, they see, and then the role of open source in their um, generative AI deployment. But generative AI comments, the organization I'm representing, I'm a chair of, is part of LFAI and data. And the reason we call it commons instead of committee is, like I said, we subscribe to you know open membership. So anybody in the world can join and you don't have to be a Linux Foundation member or you know, LFAI and data member. Um, we think that you know, the more people join our work, the better. So that's why we call it generative AI commons. Yeah. Any more question? If not, uh, thank you so much for your presence. And I understand you must be really tired from this whole day. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.